Welcome everyone. We are really excited about our webinar today and the topic is top of mind for everyone, including those in business, technology, and especially HubSpot users. And that leads us to the title of our webinar, How HubSpot Users Are Closing Faster with AI, ChatGPT, and Intelligent Quote to Cash. Really excited about our featured panelists. First, let me just check in with them. We have Chris Thornton, CEO of Open Path. Hey, Chris. Hello, oh, Phil. Great, great, great to be here today. Absolutely. And we also have the CEO of Mobile Force, Jagadish Bandhole. Jagadish. Hey, Phil. Hey, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining and participating. I know everyone is excited about this. This will be an interactive discussion, so feel free to add questions and comments in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get to those toward the end. And with that, let me just set the stage for our topic and why it's so important. Everyone is talking about AI, and specifically, AI in the enterprise is compelling for a few key reasons. And this quote from Jason Lemkin really illustrates that. He says, AI is the hottest topic in the enterprise. Why? The reason is efficiency. If AI can cut costs and deliver more efficiency, that's exactly where budget is available in 2023. And this really sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. It's about efficiency, it's about speed, and how to close and manage deals in this unique and challenging environment that we have right now. So with that, we wanted to ask folks a question which is, and this will be a poll question, you can literally just answer right in that Zoom uh, menu you've got. To what extent is your company using AI today as part of your typical sales and marketing processes? And if you can just take half a minute to answer that, we'll have the answer for you shortly. And as we're waiting for the answers to come in, and again, uh, thank you for jumping in, we will talk a little bit about the agenda. The agenda is pretty straightforward. After I'm done with the intro, we'll hand things over to Chris uh, from Open Path, and then we'll go to Jagadish at Mobile Force, then back to Q&A, and that's where your questions can be answered. Again, just drop those in the Q&A section if you have something you want to chat about. And then finally, we'll wrap, wrap things up. So let's keep things moving. Again, uh, thanks for taking the time to answer this poll question. Let's see what folks had to say. Okay, the answer and the responses, oh, pretty interesting. So first we had the number one response was a small amount. 38% of those who responded said they are using AI a small amount today as part of their sales and marketing process. That was 38%. Then 23% said a moderate amount. So. In total, we have over 60% are using AI a small or moderate amount today. And then we have about 20% said not at all. Uh, and then 15% said not much today, but definitely want to learn more about how best to use AI. So we had 60% small or moderate and another 15 that want to learn more. So that's good. You're in the right place. Uh, let me just point out that we talked about AI and we saw the quote about efficiency. The reason efficiency and speed is so important in sales, first, this Nike ad really illustrates that things that used to work maybe three years ago, two years ago, even a year, a year and a half ago, may not be as effective today. And AI is a very valuable tool and opportunity to speed things up. So uh, so this Nike ad illustrates it, but uh, more specifically in a survey that was done by McKinsey, speed was cited as the number one pain point and number one priority with vendors in making decisions uh, even twice as important as price. So that's why speed is critical. Uh, so let's connect the dots. So given how important speed is, where does AI fit in? Well, AI, and automation speed up the sales process in two fundamental ways. And we'll dig into both here in this webinar. First is in that first half of the sales process. 
taking leads and converting them into opportunities. And Chris is going to dive in more into the prospecting, the content generation, and the reporting aspects there. Then there's the second half and the closing part of the process, which is once you have a quote or proposal or opportunity, how does a company move those deals along to actually closing them and converting them into revenues? So that quote to contract phase is also critical. And Jagadish will be talking about accelerating quoting and proposals, the uh, upselling, as well as approvals and rules process for that second half of the process. So that sets the stage. That's why this is such an important topic. And with that, let me go ahead and formally introduce you to Chris from Open Path. Chris. Great, thank you, Bill. So what I wanna to do today, because AI is such a broad topic, we'll spend a few moments at a macro level, and then we'll dive into some task applications of HubSpot, ChatSpot, AI program. So Phil, next slide. So this, this is a journey. Um, there is a kind of a tradition in my family where we tell the story of my great grandfather that left his wife and seven kids here in Texas back in the 1850s, 1860s, and headed to California to hunt for gold because of opportunity. And we kind of look at today, or at least I look at today with that history in my mind, that we're in a similar place with a huge amount of opportunity in front of us, but you know, some intrepidation, there's some concerns, there's even some fears that you hear from the media. So we'll, we'll go through that and then we'll dive into, into some specific things. But one thing I wanted to point out here, this image was generated by HubSpot's chat spot. And so I needed a vintage image of an 1850s gold mining town. And I said, okay, let's, this, is a good, this is a good test. So I asked it for a vintage photo. I wanted some canvas tents. I wanted a stream. I wanted some trees and I wanted a donkey. And this is, the gener this is what was generated. So what I think is really interesting here is, and we'll talk a little bit about context today. Within the context of an 1850s gold mining community, there's probably gonna be uh, some fires, you know, some cooking areas, uh, campfires, et cetera. So right in the middle of the image, you'll see that the AI put in some smoke coming from a campfire. Uh, the other thing that's interesting to me within the context, again, the donkey is in the center of the image all the way to the right by a tent. Uh, it's pretty small, but what, what you see is within the context, it knew that donkeys were beasts of burden. They carried supplies. And in the 1850s, the donkey had a backpack where it could carry supplies in the gold mining camp. So that to me gave me a glimpse of, of AI and how it works and how it takes inputs and creates something new. So yeah, next slide. So here's, here's our image of the gold rush for 2023. This is just a small glimpse of some of the companies that are using AI, developing AI software, somehow AI is being utilized in their services and products. So I go back, I'll go back to the story of my, my, grand, my great grandfather. What are the stories that we're gonna be telling our grandkids as we go through this AI journey? Um, being here at the cusp, how will it end? You know, we don't know. So let's jump into the journey here a little bit. Next slide, okay. So one big concern is how is AI gonna impact each one of us? So I was talking to one of my clients a couple of weeks ago, and she was a marketing manager. And her comment was, well, if AI can do all of this, will I have a job? And so, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So if you, if you step back and think what AI does is it empowers creativity. Uh, it's much less structured. So for some people that can adapt to that mode, there'll be great opportunities. The other side of the story is in my, in my role as senior strategist for Open Path, we do a lot of work for our clients where we do competitive analysis. 
we do digital due diligence pre-acquisition. And in those, in those task modes, I evaluate hundreds of websites every year. And pretty consistently in most verticals, and this is B2B, in most verticals, 10% of the companies demonstrate an effective digital presence, a digital platform. They can attract leads outside of their existing knowledge, you know, their community base, their existing customer base. They can educate them, qualify them, and deliver them to the sales team as qualified leads. Only 10%. There's another 20% that kind of have pieces of this in place, but the vast majority have nothing um, that is a capable digital presence. So one of the components too is, are you gonna be in the 10%? And is that 10% going to expand its lead and its dominance? Or will the other 60, 70, 80% kind of come up to some sustainable level of, of presence. So that's gonna be the question. So as I think about it a little bit further, it really depends on your foundation. If you don't have a strong foundation and you try to implement AI, you're not gonna be successful. So from an open path standpoint, we've selected HubSpot as the base factor in our platform for that lead generation, lead qualification, delivery to sales. And then from the standpoint of quoting, closing and winning, and getting that information back to the sales and marketing team, those sales insights, that complete loop is what we call our foundation. So why HubSpot? Well, a lot of the CRMs in the industry, the larger ones have grown from acquisition. So they started with the basic CRM as they saw functionality that they wanted. They went and bought the company, pulled it in, cobbled it together, made some kind of workable platform. HubSpot, on the other hand, basically started with a single platform and built it all on the single platform in-house. So from a, from a perspective of which, which type CRM platform should be able to more successfully and more quickly implement AI, I have to go with, with, with HubSpot as the winner in that area. Uh, the other factor that kind of drove us down the path of looking for a good CPQ, which is configuring price and quoting process, is um, the fact that some of our, some of our clients utilize uh, Salesforce. And it'd be the slide before this film. Uh, utilize Salesforce and it's it's complex and it's expensive and they were looking for some way to close that feedback loop and we can do it with an integration between Salesforce and HubSpot but they were looking for a good way to close that loop inexpensively and uh, with minimal complexity and that's the reason we chose mobile force so here's the slide why mobile force okay um Mobile Force, we, we looked at a lot of CPQ capability type programs and Mobile Force provided the best, the tightest integration. So not only did, did Mobile Force enable like a standard playbook with rules, dependencies, approval flows, discounting, and allowed it to work and integrate back into HubSpot deals, forecasting, workflows, and automations. So by being able to close that loop, as, as the diagram here shows, we can take those, those sales insights that come from the quoting and the winning and closing process, feed it back into marketing and sales, do a continuous improvement loop, and just consistently reduce the customer acquisition cost. So that's, that's what we call the foundation. Okay, next slide, Phil. So ChatSpot AI. So HubSpot's ChatSpot is their interpretation of ChatGPT. And the big deal here is it's inside of your HubSpot portal. So inside of your portal, you can generate text, emails, blogs, and they're already in your HubSpot portal. You don't have to cut and paste them and stick them in. 
Uh, you can do image creation. Uh, there's some good research tools. Um, when you build reports, lists, you can generate emails, and it's all in your HubSpot account, which is a huge advantage. ChatSpot is in the alpha version today. There's weekly updates. And in the final slide of the slide deck, you'll see uh, a link to ChatSpot and to a blog. And you register and you can get weekly updates on, on improvements and, and, and new, new things that they're doing. Even with that, HubSpot believes they're about 10% of their capability. But we're already seeing some opportunities where it is cost-effective, it's time-effective. There are some good applications today, even at 10%. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we talked about context, you know, the 1850s uh, mining camp, the context. It's a very similar situation here. And there's a tension between being able to use natural language and request responses from ChatSpot versus using prompts. And probably at this stage, most people will just use the prompts. But as, as ChatSpot evolves and as each corporation develops the context that they want to have their brand and their communication and their content operate within, I think we'll move more to natural language request. But for now, uh, you can see um, prompts. There's prompts for contact writing. There's your host spot account. There's marketing, reporting, research, SEO, sales. Uh, a lot of prompts to help us get started in AI. Next slide. So we're going to look at a couple of the prompts. So here's a prompt, and this is more of a natural language prompt. I said, draft an email about these two products to prospect. So I went to my website and I copied a paragraph and said, okay, here's the first product, dropped it in, went to my website, copied a, a, another paragraph or another product, dropped it in, hit prompt, and this is the response I got. And I asked it to draft an email. So fill the next slide. And boom, we get a, a, an email. It's nicely formatted. What I think is interesting, it has the personalization tokens. Uh, that HubSpot users will be familiar with, where you could use this email as a mass email and the personalization token would fill in the subject line, the name, et cetera, my name uh, as HubSpot owner. So that's pretty cool. But I saw the personalization token, so I thought I'd push it a little bit. So let's go to the next slide. So this next, next prompt is, okay, draft the email, but send it to somebody in my HubSpot account. In this situation, I'd David Hardwick. And it was interesting. The response was, well, sorry, I understand what you want, but I just can't do that yet. So that to me says, yeah, probably we're going to get there. We're just not there at that 10% level. So uh, here's this one shortened this content by 50%. So, so this is a prompt. So I wanted to see, okay, that was a fairly long email. I'd like it shorter. So there's a brevity brought, a brevity, brevity bot prompt. And I said, okay, let's reduce, reduce, reduce by 50%. And you can see it gave me a, a reasonable 50% starting spot, uh, just like the, the longer email. It's probably 85% there. But if you're like me, that first, that first initial thought process of pulling the email together is hard. I can tweak it I love tweaking things, but just coming up with the original is really hard. So I love this from the standpoint of we can take it from this point, spend a few minutes tweaking it, and we're done. Okay, next. Uh, this is a prompt for a reporting, um, a report. So sometimes reports, you have to put in the properties, and, and it takes a little while to build them out. I basically wanted to know what leads or what contacts were generated from a referring website. So basically on the left, it was a contact property or a contact object, um, Time frame last 90 days. And I put in the website that I wanted to track. It gave me a report. Uh, what I thought was interesting here is um, I asked for the original source. There's multiple layer, layers of original source in HubSpot. 
So it drilled down to the most granular, granular level to get to the, the, the website that was referring. So that was interesting because I didn't tell it to do that. It knew to do that on its own. And you can just click the button, save the HubSpot, and you've got it saved as a report. And next one. This is one that they just recently added. It, it popped up this week. And it's a company news prompt. And basically all you do is if you're researching a company, you put in the company URL, hit the prompt, and within a second, it came back. And, it, and, and there was more than this, but I, I reduced it. But here's four videos that were produced by HubSpot, a press release, and then a news post. And what's interesting in your HubSpot account, in ChatSpot, these are all live links. So you can click on the link, go to the original source um, and read, read it from the original source. So that's a real time saver. And the last slide, uh, Phil, you had up the 10% challenge. So remember earlier, we talked about the, within B2B, within certain verticals, approximately 10% of the companies had a good viable um, digital, lead generation platform and a digital presence. And we're able to come in and provide the education, the lead capture, move it over to sales, which I call the foundation. You have to have that right before you can really start benefiting from, from making it faster. You have to have it correct first, and then you can use AI to make it faster. If you have it correct, you'll save a tremendous amount of sales time. Uh, our data shows 10 to, 50, 10 to 15 times uh, higher productivity from your sales team if they're not having to do cold calling and a lot of the, the initial connection themselves. If your website does that, they get a, a qualified lead to close much, much faster, much, much more efficient. So if your company is not in the 10% and you're looking for a couple of, of partner companies that can help you get there, Open Path and Mobile Force are certainly standing by to help you. We look forward to chatting with you in the near future. And with that, Phil, I'll turn it back over to you. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. And very well said with the 10% challenge. It's also, Chris, great to see what is being done today with HubSpot and ChatSpot and then what can be done. So it's fascinating to follow because I know these are changing very quickly. Uh, so thank you so much, Chris. And a reminder, this is an interactive webinar, so feel free to add any questions into that Q&A section, and Chris and Jagadish will address those toward the end. Uh, we have another poll question on that topic of being interactive, which is, we just want to find out what role uh, and title folks have that are here today, because that helps the perspective of both of our presenters. Are you Marketing focused, sales biz dev focused, rev ops, sales ops, or sales admin focused, or founder CEO or other. Just add that and we'll have the results shortly. While we wait for that, I so again, thank you. Uh, let me check in with our next presenter. Uh, Jagadish, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Phil. Great to be here. Absolutely. And uh, before I formally hand things over, I think we've got some results and then I'll let you uh, take uh, take the ball from there. Uh, we have some updates. Here we go. Uh, first, the number one role was sales or biz dev focused. 35% of you uh, identify there. 31% identify as marketing focused. So that that's roughly two thirds are either in sales, biz dev, or on the marketing side of the equation. We do have 16% that said they were rev ops, sales ops, or sales admin, and then 13% founder CEO and 5% other. So that's fascinating. Uh, thank you all for joining. And again, if you have specific questions, just put those in the Q&A section. And with that, let me formally hand things over to Jagadish. And Jagadish, why don't I let you share your screen? How's that? Great. You got it. Here you go. Let me know if you folks uh, see my screen okay. Yes, looks great. 
excellent. Um, before I jump right into uh, quoting or any aspects of the second half of the sales cycle, um, just want a quick intro to who we are. Uh, Mobile Force, we are a RevOps automation company. We specifically help salespeople, many of you are salespeople here, um, uh, build, quickly build, configure, and produce uh, great looking quotes accurately for even the most complex product sets and uh, dynamic pricing and other kinds of scenarios that we see uh, a lot uh, today. Uh, certainly we see um, aspects of that in across industries, um, uh, manufacturing services, and of late, of course, uh, a lot of subscription pricing uh, in, in software uh, businesses as well. Our product is very user-centric. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, it's intuitive and it's built and designed for administrators themselves to mold it to your own user's workflows as opposed to a static uh, front end that everybody has to adapt to. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about that a little bit later. And uh, we also are powered by a no-code platform, which uh, essentially means that we put the power in the hands of the practitioners. That is, uh, for those of you admins out there, um, I, I guess about 16% or so in the webinar today, um, uh, there's a lot of things that we do that put the power in the uh, hands of uh, you folks uh, so you could manage and uh, mold the environment yourself. Um, in effect, uh, our focus is on uh, moving deals um, faster uh, from code to close, make it more efficient and more transparent uh, throughout the process. So with that, I want to focus um, you know, my uh, presentation here on, on two parts. You, you know, it, it seems like there are sales and business focus folks uh, uh, in, in the audience as well as administrators. So I kind of divided it into two uh, parts here. Uh, seller experience, I want to cover that first and then uh, a little bit also touch upon uh, the uh, administrative experience as well. We have a lot of innovation that we bring to the market on both sides. Um, uh, let me start off with the seller experience. It's all about speed, right? Speed and efficiency and correctness. And again, uh, taking over from where Chris uh, talked about, um, AI is just one of those tools, one of those means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Um, we will always have uh, things that uh, you will continue to do things manually. Uh, you will have a number of things that can be automated and made more efficient. And you will have a number of things that probably possibly could be assisted by uh, an AI assistant. Uh, so in that vein, uh, let me share a little bit about you know, what we have been working on um, in the same uh, realm of um, um, chat GPT and chat spot. Uh, uh, we've been working on, uh, busy working on a feature called chat CPQ. And uh, um, to that extent, um, let me kind of show you a couple of interaction here. Uh, in this case, focus is on a seller um, who can go through a set of steps, uh, certainly which we've made very, very easy and intuitive and accessible. Uh, and they can go through point and click mechanisms to very quickly build and configure and roll out a quote. Uh, but we are augmenting that with uh, where it makes sense uh, through AI mechanisms, uh, NLP and machine learning and so on and so forth to see if we can actually speed up things even, even more and maybe save a few more keystrokes and uh, make things uh, easier for sellers. So here's a sample session uh, that uh, sort of illustrates uh, what we've been working on, where a seller goes in and you, know, you wanna quickly build a quote um, for a certain set of products for a particular customer. I go in there and I say, well, give me a quote for hundred junction boxes for Nixco plumbing. A lot of these are inspired by our actual customers. So the products and, 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 and the customers. So you can kind of uh, relate to that uh, here. Uh, I think I hit the wrong keystroke. Let me go back to that and go back to my uh, uh, screen here. So yeah, so uh, the the system comes back with uh, a uh, answer, right? Where, you know, it obviously found multiple hits on that junction boxes. There are different variations of junction boxes out there in the product catalog. And so it comes back to me saying, hey, which one do you want? Uh, uh, certainly you want 100 quantity, but which, which one of those you want? And uh, you, know, you can respond back um, with B. And so it comes back with a particular um, a quick draft quote, the line items table for here's a quick uh, 100 quantity uh, line item for this particular thing. It goes and looks up. Uh, the price book that you have as the default price book. And uh, 
it also automatically discovered that there is a standard discount that's uh, uh, based on a particular customer attribute that you set up for Nixco uh, plumbing or based on your standard discount that you're doing, let's say this quarter, uh, et cetera, it, it plugged in that 30% discount and it provided you that capability there. So now you can kind of continue the conversation, right? And say, well, let's just go ahead and update the discount to 40%, right? Again, it's something that you could click on a few things, three or four clicks and go and, and change that very quickly in, in our system to 40%, or you could just simply ask the system to do it and you could continue to build that code out um, conversationally. And the next step that I ask is, hey, there are certain bundles, um, you know, can you go ahead and update these junction boxes with all the add-ons, uh, which is something that we constantly see. Many of our customers utilize our system for, and they build bundle products with tier pricing, volume pricing, and things like that. So here is an example of a bundle product where I want to add a few more bundle add-ons um, with the same 40% uh, account, and it goes and updates that particular quote, but it also runs through um, a, a set of uh, rules uh, that kind of scrolled up there, which basically said, well, you asked for a 40% discount, but there are certain rules that limit the discount to only 20% for certain line items here. Um, and there's another one that where it limits it to only 30%. And so it limited it, auto-corrected auto it, and it basically produced um, a table, updated table with uh, that combination. And then I'll, I continue to build out the proposal and say, I'm happy with it. Go ahead and create a proposal. Uh, again, it just basically picks a few things. Before it builds out a proposal, one of the very important things is a lot of these uh, interactions that we are seeing here, it's really the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, the real work is being done in the back end. Unless the infrastructure supports it, you really cannot have this kind of seamless interaction. And I think that's something that I want to stress here. Uh, you probably already saw a couple of those uh, like discount rules being fired at the right time, uh, information from CRM and other attributes being uh, flown in uh, real time to uh, select the right kind of discount, standard discounts. And here is another example where, where I want to go ahead and create a proposal. It does go and check, for example, an inventory. There could be, again, a data integration where um, a quote is being influenced whether a certain item is available or not. And... Um, that's one of those things that we excel in as well to be able to bring real-time data integration, not just from CRM, but also from third-party sources. And uh, in this case, the system comes back and says, you know, particular item is not available. And so would you want me to suggest an alternate? And if you would like to pick the alternate, then you could substitute and it goes, goes ahead and generates a PDF proposal uh, with that particular, um, you know, details. And then you could essentially then go in and say, okay, that looks good. I'm ready to go and go ahead and request approvals. And the approvals could be multiple levels. You know, it could be a single level up to X, X percentage discount. I just need approval from my manager. And in this case, there are larger discounts involved. So I might require multiple levels of approval, whether it's from a, uh, my VP of finance or all the way up to my CEO, right? And so it goes uh, uh, to uh, get the approvals. Uh, approvals could be for all items or for some specific items uh, again. And then finally, it gets all of those approvals done and um, this quote is approved and you have a proposal ready to be sent out. So it's just an illustrative uh, session um, that you could also go through the point and click mechanism and uh, 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 thereby go through those process. But at the same time, you can use something like an AI to speed things up uh, even more. Uh, I will show that in a, a real live demo in a couple of minutes uh, before I wrap up. But before I get to that, I want to highlight a couple of things uh, for those of you in web ops, sales ops, uh, and sales administration. There's a lot of things that I showed there that would only be possible if you actually set things up in the right way. And, and that's why uh, um, it's very, very important to make sure that you could not only set things up, but you could set things up quickly and, and efficiently as well. Uh, if it takes you months and months to actually set things up right, then it doesn't serve the purpose. So one of the things that we've uh, focused on as well is to remove uh, a lot of the complexity that's involved in the, the setup piece of the process, which is usually behind the scenes, uh, happens all the time whether it's setting up um, uh, approvals, uh, configuration options. If you can sell product A, you cannot sell product B because they're incompatible. 
or if you sell something, then you must sell something else as an add-on. Um, selling bundles and pricing rules associated with that. Um, we talked about data integration, where uh, if you are selling a particular product to a particular industry or a particular target target segment, uh, then make sure that uh, only certain editions are sold or uh, certain add-ons are automatically in, uh, included. And that requires uh, information that might need to flow in from CRM or from an ERP system. Uh, these are things that are common use cases. And historically, these things have taken um, a lot of coding and a lot of uh, uh, outside help, uh, uh, if you will, to be able to kind of put things uh, uh, in place. And one of the things that we've done is we've made a lot of that, those things um, self-serviceable in the, in the spirit of SaaS. We've uh, put that in the hands of uh, sales practitioners using our no-code platform. Uh, a lot of those elements, whether it is uh, configuring rules or specifying uh, experiences, selling experiences, uh, specifying the guided selling questionnaires um, or mapping data that might need to come from external systems, you can do that yourself in our administrative user interfaces. This is just a sample of that. Um, and uh, we'll be more than happy to kind of dig deeper into that in any one-on-one -on -one conversation subsequently. But with that, let me just kind of show you a couple of things here uh, in, in, in a live uh, demo in a, in a HubSpot environment here. I have a HubSpot instance um, and I open up a deal, uh, a poster child deal here, um, uh, CPQ uh, uh, aspect uh, shows up and typically it uh, manifests uh, itself uh, uh, in the context of a particular deal. You can, you can access our CPQ uh, directly either on a, as a, on a standalone basis, or you can access in a particular deal. So if I go into a particular uh, HubSpot deal here, I can open that up and I can open up uh, the mobile force CPQ here. And let's say if I open up uh, the associated proposals, uh, then you know they show up here. Um, in this context, um, I can open up within the context of HubSpot. It's, so it's seamlessly integrated, both read, write. Uh, I can also open it up in a separate tab uh, if that's much more convenient. Uh, in the interest of time, let me just kind of click through a, a proposal that I had created here. It's already created, uh, and I want to highlight a couple of things here. If I go into the quote tab, um, uh, first of all, the, what I'm showing you here is a completely configurable seller experience. Uh, this experience, you know, it says a step one, two, three, four, five, choose a customer, create a quote, get your approvals, do your signatures, uh, e-signatures, and generate the documents. You could certainly change it and mold it to exactly match your workflow by just going through the CPQ setup. And you could use any of our self-service capabilities here. Uh, practitioners can set that up to match exactly your business uh, uh, workflows. Um, but once you do that, uh, your sellers will find a familiar experience in terms of things that they normally do and, and add, um, as well as things that are uh, specific that you could do in our system that uh, are very easy to do. For example, here, I've got a few line items um, um, and I'll show you an example of a deal variable that may be coming from a CRM. In this case, there is a deal variable that's associated with a particular type of a customer that flows in here. I have a standard managed service and I could go change this to enterprise. Again, this information is flowing in automatically from outside from CRM through the data integration. And if I go and validate that, uh, you could see that the, the pricing automatically changes based on the um, particular type of customer I'm trying to sell into. Um, enterprise edition, standard edition, so on and so forth. Similarly, uh, there are things that I could change within the context of the quote itself. Um, one of the things that really a lot of our customers in the HubSpot ecosystem really love about our, uh, our solution is our ability to provide uh, a lot of different pricing schemes, such as uh, dynamic pricing schemes, tier pricing, volume pricing, things like that. So here's an example of a product which has, let's say I've got 51 quantity of this and I can change it into uh, a different uh, um, a tier 11 automatically picks up tier pricing based on that, which is again, will set up under price books uh, uh, here and it automatically picks up the right tier. Uh, you also can do volume pricing where you know the entire volume gets uh, discounted to a particular volume price. Uh, you could do additional line item level pricing based on discounting rules, whether it's allowed or not. Uh, you could also do things like block pricing where you have a certain fixed amount uh, that is chosen. So if I want to uh, 
uh, choose a particular block, let's say 20,000 and above, you know, 22,000. Uh, it chooses a particular fixed block, uh, $3,500 sub, uh, subtotal, and automatically calculates the unit price based on that. Um, so I could use different blocks, and you could see there are different block pricing that are uh, chosen there. So some of the examples of the kinds of things that you can uh, do here. In the interest of time, I'll move into approvals. Um, that particular um, uh, quote required approval, um, and I submitted that, and I got it approved. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, different levels of approvals are uh, allowed. You can send it to multiple uh, um, different people in the organization to approve it, and you could set rules around it. And once it's all approved, um, it would allow you to do digital signatures. There are a variety of different digital signatures supported. There's built-in scribble signatures. There is DocuSign, uh, Adobe EcoSign, and other e-signature platforms that are supported. You could certainly send that uh, as an envelope through that. Uh, you could... Um, I choose a variety of different templates to then create your output proposals uh, that sort of look like this. You could uh, choose your own templates that are uh, that has um, just just like mail merge. Uh, it automatically merges in the tokens uh, that you've chosen in your um, quote and and creates a collated uh, output document that again you can send it through an e-signature platform or you can uh, get it. Uh, 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 signed through the customer through an online portal. Uh, so those are all some of those um, uh, seller. So you can see from a seller experience perspective, A to Z, what used to take hours and potentially more than a day um, can be now shrunk down to a matter of minutes. Uh, you could do it um, interactively through these uh, steps, or you could use an AI assistant to speed things up even further. Um, let me just switch uh, a little bit here, and I'll wrap up in a minute. Um, I want to just highlight a couple of things in terms of um, uh, administrative experience. Um, uh, switching to the product setup itself, I want to uh, show you uh, configurable uh, products. You could have products that are straightforward products, and you could also have configurable products. Um, products that are uh, that I showed you today um, here earlier were just straightforward standalone products which had different pricing. You could also add configurable products which require further configuration. So such as uh, if I want to go ahead and add, let's say an appliance like a, like a cooking range, which you can just sell as it is, but it requires a certain level of um, uh, configuration. Uh, you could add that and, and you can click on this pencil icon and it would then present you an experience on how to configure it. Let's say I want to uh, configure it as an, uh, it's an electric and requires five burners and it's a 36 inch width. That's the model I want, and you can actually save it, and appropriately, it will go pick the right price for it and, uh, and add that. And that entire experience that I showed you here can actually be set up um, right here within the particular product itself, where I can actually go look for um, uh, a cooking range product, and uh, I can um, configure that product in the product catalog, uh, in a variety of different ways. I can set up seasonal products, products that can be only sold in particular sectors. We looked at uh, that layout, that configure uh, configuration layout. You can very quickly and easily configure uh, those layouts here, literally uh, exactly to the specification that you want uh, there. Uh, this is the power of the no-code system that I talked about. Uh, and once you have, have that, you can go into configuration rules, um, bundling, and pricing, different pricing rules. Um, I talked about different pricing rules with tiering and all of that. You can you can create uh, different tiers, uh, unit pricing, block pricing, et cetera. So that's just a quick uh, tour of, of the kinds of things you could do from an administrative perspective. There's a whole lot more that you could do. Um, again, uh, for those of you who are in the audience would love more information, um, please contact us. We'll be happy to have a uh, session with you and discuss your use cases and needs. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap up and turn it over to Phil. That's great. Thanks so much, Jagadish. Great to see the demo of Chat CPQ. Also great to hear about how the quote to cash process can be streamlined from both the seller perspective and the admin and ops side as well. So great to get that perspective. And we've got questions. So that's a good segue. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And then we'll invite Chris back in. And uh, this has definitely been a popular topic. We have a number of questions 
that have come in here today during the webinar and even prior coming in. So let me uh, remind everyone that there's some links and resources that they can access here. Chris, let me start with you for the first question, which is you've talked a little bit about how to take advantage of AI and needing to get certain things in place. Can you maybe explain, because folks are curious, how can they benchmark and understand their own organization's readiness to implement AI-powered solutions to help them for their quote-to-cash process? Good question. Um, you know, for benchmarking, you really need to have some, some industry benchmarks to benchmark against it. Um, we, you know, at OpenPath, we've spent the last five years developing those industry benchmarks. Um, I would, I would, you know, and, and we, we look at certain KPIs in that lead generation, education, qualification process. And I, I think probably the best thing is just contact me after the webinar. And if you're, if, uh, if, you, if they're already a HubSpot user, we can look at their uh, HubSpot um, information and do a pretty quick high level assessment and see if we need to dig any deeper. Right. But um, yeah, to do benchmarks, you have to have something to, some industry benchmark to, to use relative to. So. Absolutely. And just a reminder, uh, folks can reach both Chris and Jagadish at the uh, contact information on the screen. Jagadish, a lot of folks uh, have come to you and come to the webinar. They are dealing with complex situations, whether it's multi-tiered pricing, or multi-party transactions or distribution, like in the example you showed, what do you say and how do you work with companies that come to you in those scenarios to try to make this setup as easy as possible? What are the key steps that they can take with you and Mobile Force to do that? Yeah, um, it, it goes back to what I mentioned as user-centric design. So usually what we do is um, right up front, we work with, um, uh, we partner with subject matter experts um, in, in our customers who understand what their workflows are and what their, how they transact, how they generate, how their salespeople build the quotes and, and share it and uh, negotiate and con uh, close them as contracts. And the idea would be to basically use the platform and the tool set that we provide and mold itself to create a seller experience and an approval experience and a transactional experience that closely matches what um, uh, they do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? The goal is to be able to take the system and mold it to what the users do as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and uh, a lot of it goes into um, having that early input from subject matter experts, so certainly practitioners who've done that, supporting their sales teams for years, um, and understanding how they uh, go about sort of day in the life of salesperson uh, today and taking that input and using our tool sets to be able to craft the, configure the right kind of experiences and the right kind of automations to sort of uh, implement that uh, uh, workflow. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for that. And again, any final questions? We've got about uh, five minutes, uh, so we'll keep things moving. Uh, but you can drop your question in. We may not have time for all of them, but we will circle back. Chris, next question is, how does having mobile force and a quote to cash system from mobile force, along with the one, one loss data that you've referenced, integrated with HubSpot, help the marketing and lead gen process? We have a lot of folks that are sales practitioners uh -huh. want to know what can they do and how does that help? Yeah, so you know, from a from a marketing standpoint, the marketing team always desires to generate the most leads. The sales team desires the most leads that are qualified and easy to close. The the financial accounting team wants the marketing and the sales team to sell the products that generate the most margins, right? So, so there's all of those insights that can be collected during that journey between marketing sales and then the close one portion. 
So as an example, there, there may be a certain, and, and to really get down to nuts and bolts, in HubSpot, you have landing pages, you have various um, uh, assets that you offer as, as downloadable content. Those assets have a certain download rate. You know, they have a certain proficiency, a certain um, level of performance. Well, you, you, want to, you want to understand the particular lead gen functions that generate the most leads, right? But then you also want to understand, okay, when I'm generating leads through this product line or through this uh, educational channel, you may, you may find that one channel, the sales team can close 20% of the leads. Another channel, they may close 40% of the leads. Yep. Well, if you can understand that and feed that back to the marketing team, they can look at that journey through that channel that's performing well. Yep. Okay, what's different about this channel versus a channel that's not performing well? So a lot of it's data analytics. Um, my background's in engineering, I love data, but data can be used to continuously improve that process because of that feedback loop. And the more efficient you get that process, the lower your customer acquisition costs, the, the, the less difficulty your sales team has closing deals. Um, the sales team can gravitate towards leads that are easier to close. There, yep. There's a lot of benefits of, of bringing that information back into the marketing team. In, in so many situations, marketing and sales and even finance are independent silos. And without the interconnectivity and the information flowing between them, people just keep doing what they've been doing. Yep. And you don't get that continuous improvement loop built in. It makes total sense. Uh, well, well explained. Thank you uh, for that. And uh, let me just check in. We're gonna do quick one minute answers and uh, we'll try to do two more. Uh, Jagadish, uh, when companies approach you, and they ask about the differentiators. What separates Mobile Force from other CPQ options that are out there? What are the key things you like to point to? Uh, primarily three things. Um, one is this concept that I've shown hopefully today and explained, uh, which is um, you get to design your own seller experiences, right? Which actually is very, very important because that drives user adoption. So for practitioners to be able to have this tool set where they can mold their workflows, mold the system to kind of match their workflows and their inputs and their exact experiences, I think that's that's a pretty big uh, uh, differentiator we've heard from our customer base. Um, the other aspect of it is, um, along with that, is, is the ability to sort of self-manage uh, rules and data integrations easily so that it doesn't take a long time for because things change all the time. There'll be new deal variables that get introduced into the process all the time. There'll be new CRM attributes that get generated all the time. Um, and uh, ability to kind of utilize that very quickly and work, work that into the coding process is important. Um, and then the third aspect of it um, is um, all of this around, um, you know, speeding things up, right? Uh, so, um, I should also mention, um, you know, some of the functional areas around uh, the different dynamic uh, pricing, tiered pricing, block pricing, all of that that I showed, it's something that uh, specifically in the HubSpot community, a lot of our customers uh, uh, have really talked about that as something that we do pretty well and uniquely. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, associated with that also is, is ability to have uh, a mobile access to the coding environment with uh, online, offline capability. Um, you know, a, a lot of... Uh, our users in the manufacturing sector and services sector, where they don't uh, necessarily have full connectivity. That's one of those uh, sectors where they have a lot of field sales. Uh, that's one of those things that's also a differentiator. So uh, those, are, those are a handful of items. Uh, thank you, very compelling. And now we'll do one more question and 30 seconds each. Uh, Jagadish first and then Chris. When somebody wants to engage and get started, how long uh, does it typically take to actually scope out the work involved and get them uh, down the path 
for implementing a quote to cash solution? What are the types of variables and how long does that take? First you, and then I'll ask Chris the same question. Yeah, typically it's just, uh, it can be as little as a week, um, can be up to four weeks, depending on the uh, complexity of uh, things that you're trying to in, uh, in integrate. Um, things that only are uh, self-contained are things like uh, rules and your existing templates and whatnot, that, that can be done pretty quickly. You can be up and running in a matter of few days. Uh, we can discover, set it up and good to go. Uh, if you have third-party integrations and external sources, um, obviously that will usually involve a few more stakeholders and that might take an extra uh, two to three weeks. But that's generally been our average range of uh, implementation. That's great. Thank you. I'll check in with Chris. Let me remind everyone, you can reach both Jagadish and Chris and Mobile Force and Open Path through the info that's on the screen. Chris, when you are contacted by prospects and companies that are wanting to get started, how long does it typically take for you and Open Path to scope things out and give them a good assessment of what the proper steps are? Uh, roughly, how long does that usually take? Yeah, you know, usually the first the first pass high level, what are what are the the high level opportunities we can usually, especially if they're using HubSpot already, uh, we can jump into their HubSpot account, we can spend 30 minutes and get a real high level overview of you know what what is the level of opportunity and does it make sense? And then from that point, it's just a matter of what we determine is the best use of everybody's money and time. That's great. Uh, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Jagadish. Really want to thank both of you for leading the way in our discussion. I know we didn't quite get to every comment and question, but we can and will circle back. This was a great topic. We really I want appreciate to, uh, point out one more thing, if I can interject. Um, Jagadish. You know, we are on HubSpot. We are a certified uh, marketplace partner of HubSpot. Uh, our system is a, um, a preferred CPQ partner at HubSpot. So one of the benefits of that is it's easy to set up trial instances. I see some questions uh, out there. How do you get started? Um, so not only we are available from a uh, advice uh, perspective and to help you set things up right, but you, the systems themselves are very easy and seamless to set up. From right from within your HubSpot environment, we can set up instances and configure it, and you could you could uh, immediately see it working, uh, and then you could organically iterate and and uh, get to your end goal. So I just wanted to mention that. That's great, thank you, Jagadish. So they can find Mobile Force in that HubSpot App Store by just searching for Mobile Force CPQ. Is that correct? That's correct in the marketplace. That is fantastic. Thank you again, Jagadish. Thank you again, Chris. Thanks to all of you. I want to also thank the teams at Mobile Force and at Open Path for helping market and prepare this event. It's been a great discussion, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.